We are live, my friend. We are, I am with uh, Mr. Kyle Kemper. Uh, how are you, Kyle? I'm doing fantastic, Sonny. Oh, Always it, a pleasure to be speaking with you. Isn't it? Well, it's nice to be reconnecting. Oh my goodness. Uh, we have not known each other for far too long. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to remember when we, when we actually met for the first time. Do you have any idea? First time I met you was I was working with CA Vertex and it was at the Money Show in Toronto at the Toronto Convention Center. And that's when Sunny Ray walked into my life. Wow. Wow. What a moment it must have been. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I, yeah, yeah. CA Vertex. Boy, do I ever remember that. That was what Canada's first Bitcoin exchange, right? Out of based out of Calgary, I think it was. Uh, yeah, wow. 2012 it started and it was the biggest exchange in Canada for a long time and mm. it was one of the real pioneers within the industry. Interesting. So, uh, so I guess let's start with my first question, which is, you know, before you got into Bitcoin and we're going to talk before about Before we that. get to that, Sonny. Oh, yes, you do. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you remember? Do you do remember, remember when we met? I had a screen at the money show in Toronto showing the Bitcoin video casino and we were gambling on the floor of the casino with anybody who is interested. And it was just an amazing way to introduce people to the tech <laughs> <laughs> and what Bitcoin represented <laughs> and represents digital cash. <laughs> so people like playing roulette and I, I mean, or blackjack. We could just do it instantly. It was so much fun. I'm not sure I do remember, remember those, those days. I remember those days. Those were, those were interesting times. Uh, but yes okay so 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 my first question would be like your story so what was your what's your what's your backstory before you got into bitcoin kyle we're gonna talk about swiss key and you know the company and all that but before that the yeah i'm mean, curious I, I mean we've been friends for a long time i don't even know if i've really even asked you that question uh but it, well it's there now <laughs> okay well you know listen up here's my story uh, so I'm like originally born and raised out of Ottawa. I went to elementary school there and then high school there. You know, I come from a family on my, my mother's side. It was on more the political, political spectrum. She was the first lady of Canada. She's now the, you know, now my half brother's prime minister of Canada. Um, my father, Reed Kemper was a, uh, was a businessman and a restaurateur and a real estate guy in Ottawa. And so he taught me a lot about business and entrepreneurship. And uh, but I had, was fortunate to have a pretty, uh, pretty blessed childhood with lots of experiences. I'm an avid golfer and avid skier. Uh, I really loved playing golf as I was growing up. I felt it taught me a lot about kind of communication and etiquette and dealing with people from all over the place. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and yeah, and then I went to university out in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, a university called Dalhousie. That was just incredible. I was part of the OAC double cohort in Ontario, grade 13, grade 12. I was part of the year when two grades graduated at the same time because they were getting rid of the of you know five years of high school and moving it to four so it happened that one year that was called double cohort so just a ton of people flew out or were, were graduating at the same time and i ended up going to halifax with about 40 friends and uh you know it was 13 hours away from by drive from uh, from where i grew up so it really fostered a bunch of independence and uh you know and and community communal effort amongst amongst friends and it was just a, you know an incredible four years and there I studied commerce. It was a co-op program that enabled me to, you know, move around in different spaces. So I worked in accounting for a water slide company. I worked in Whistler for a winter where I skied and snowboarded almost every day and then cleaned carpets and windows for, uh, for a friend who had a business doing that. And you know, I just kind of made it work. And I looked at the schedule and there was one time that was the winter. So we picked to go to Whistler for that one. And that was incredible. Uh, and then on my last co-op, I started a web design business with, uh, with a friend who is like an internet prodigy and he was just amazing at what he did. And I helped source clients and, and contracts and then kind of project managed, um, you know, those, those contracts for four months. And then after university, uh, I got, uh, a call from, 
uh, one of my good friend's fathers, who was uh, ran ran the Business Development Bank of Canada (BDC), uh, ran their high tech uh, venture capital arm out of Ottawa. They had a billion dollar portfolio, and they were looking their their intern had just kind of dropped out, and they were looking for an analyst to come in and, and help. So I joined them and worked uh, in venture capital and one of Canada's largest funds for six months. And, you know, in that process, there was a lot of learning and it was with a big bank too. So I was like wearing a tie every day. Uh, but also like every other day was, was fielding entrepreneurs and listening to stories and listening to people, uh, you know, what they're passionate about and seeing their business plans and seeing how they're pitching, uh, et cetera. And that was great. And I met one group of uh, group of entrepreneurs through that who were really, uh, they were ex BlackBerry, ex research in motion, and they were building mobile technology for, consumers and business and enterprise around mobile data capture. And so I ended up joining them and leaving the bank and working with them for two and a half years. And we built this incredible app that allowed you to capture multiple photos, video forms, tag with your GPS location, add voice memos to it. It was just an insane little package at the time. And that's when BlackBerry and, uh, and, and, and Apple were kind of battling for you know where where was who's gonna win we put our chips on blackberry and uh you know in retrospect that was the wrong that was the wrong bet um but i learned a lot out of working with those guys and then after that i started working uh, i went to my family restaurant we've got a, a chain of restaurants in ottawa called the clock tower and it's a micro brew pub i would make our own beer and, you know, I just kind of got burnt out from, uh, from working in the tech space and, uh, and also needed money. So I ended up working uh, just as a server and a bartender. And it was incredible just being able to interface with people from all over the world. It was right in downtown Ottawa in the market. So it was heavily touristy, but also tons of locals and government. So, I mean... Mm. Anybody out there looking for something, I would I definitely recommend serving as uh, as as a great job to sharpen your communication skills, um, make some money, and also like learn, 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 learn. And it was through working in the restaurant that you know one day this guy walked in and started talking all about mm-hmm. Bitcoin and how he had fifty thousand Bitcoins in cold storage in the Isle of Man. And I just started asking questions and asking questions and asking questions. And, you know, he would come in almost every day and uh, just keep asking questions. And then I had my moment. And at the same time, I had a business doing, um, doing iPhone cases, doing custom wood engraved, laser engraved iPhone cases. And, you know, I've been querying around the Bitcoin space and, I actually got an order from someone out of Colorado who had a company called btcquick.com or something like that. I remember that was my first Bitcoin was I sold an iPhone case for half a Bitcoin in the fall of 2013. And that was, that was the beginning of what became, you know, my kind of like, you know, where are we now? Seven years in just an insane journey of, uh, of exploring, uh, you know, this new financial world. And, you know, my, my, I also like, will say that, you know, and I think it was in 2007, I watched the movie Zeitgeist and that one was a real eye opener, uh, especially around like, you know, parts one and two on religion and nine 11, like that was really interesting. But the third part was, was the men behind the curtain and exposing the central banks and their, ability to create infinite supply of money and how it benefits those around them and how, you know, I care not who you elect so long as I control the money. And I think that's very applicable today, today specifically. Um, (laughs) But, uh, you know, and then, so we looked at Bitcoin, like what's, what's like, and I, in the beginning, I dismissed Bitcoin, but then I kind of had the, uh, had the light bulb moment. And I think, you know, you, you would agree. Once you have your light bulb moment in Bitcoin, there's no going back. It's like gunpowder. You can't uninvent it. It's a, uh, it's a total game changer. Yes. Yes. Totally agree on that one. Uh, yes. So 
Interesting. Interesting. So sorry, I'm just trying to take that in. That's, uh, I mean, I had known pieces, bits and pieces of your story, but there's a lot there. Um, so, so curious now in terms of, I guess, you know, before you even get to like your kind of current project, um, what, what did your kind of, you know, cause you've had a pretty, uh, you know, interesting to say the least Bitcoin career before you started, uh, Swiss key. Right. So curious, uh, if you're, if you're down to share, a little bit of that roller coaster happily i mean it's all on my linkedin too so you know what uh when i after meeting this 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 individual uh we kind of looked looked in i got really excited and then i met bit access you know i met ryan wallace and haseba one and mo uh uh i forget his last name uh from bit access and mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. and I just loved it. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's get one of these machines in the clock tower. And so we got one of the machines into my place of work and we had a party and we called the media in and it was the first Bitcoin ATM in Ottawa. What, what year is this? When did you guys do this, this party? Is, this is like January, 2014. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I remember us even access. Yeah, yeah, the ATM machines. Okay, and we had this little kind of tabletop unit that was uh, that was in the back, and all the media showed up, and we just were yeah, we we're, 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 were we were speaking, you know, we were evangelizing crypto, and and that was great, and that was also like you know really important for me in my whole journey because I was like you know the the expert there teaching people how to download wallets, set them up buy Bitcoin, use the machine, et cetera. I was probably one of the biggest testers of those machines. Um, and, uh, you know, and it was funny because about a month after we launched that, I got a call from my friend. Uh, and my friend, he happened to be the, the, the chief aide, the primary assistant to Senator Gerstein, who, is, who was the head of the Senate Banking, Trade, and Commerce Committee. BTC committee and they were doing a 18 month study into Bitcoin and digital currency. And he asked me, can I bring the senators to the restaurant on a field trip to see how the ATM works? I was like, wow, that's awesome. Yes, of course you can. And, and huh. but you know what? I might actually be able to bring the ATM directly to the floor of the Senate if you're interested. And he was like, no way. That would be incredible. You can do that. Like, <laughs> we, can do, we can do anything we set our, our hearts and minds to, Chris. We can do this. And so, uh, so we did that. And we, put, we brought the ATM there. And he, then I, like, you know, to use a Bitcoin ATM, it maybe takes 10 minutes. 15 minutes. You want to do a full explanation? Okay, 45 minutes. He's like, I'm going to give you two hours. I'm like, two hours. Like, that's a lot of time. And then word spread that that was happening. And all of a sudden, the, 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 the Kyle Kemper giving a demo with the access of how their machine worked turned into Kyle Kemper, Victoria Van Eyck, Joseph David Toth from CA Vertex, Larry O'Brien, the former mayor of Ottawa, Siba Wan, the, 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 the founder of Bit Access, all on this panel. And we use that time to explain how one buys and sells Bitcoin. So like Victoria and I just did a $20, like Victoria, I'd like to buy $20 of Bitcoin off you. She's like, okay, like, please give me your address. I showed her my address, give me the cash. I gave her the cash and she sent the Bitcoin. And just that, just that, these senators had been studying crypto for a year and had never actually seen a transaction. So that was just like a mind blown for them. <laughs> Which I think is like a parable to this day around crypto and everybody's talking about it, but they don't actually like, they have done a transaction. They don't just understand like, you know, how it works. And something we can get into later. <laughs> um, but then we had Joseph David explain how an exchange works. And then we uh, demoed the machine and how it worked. And so that's all on YouTube. That's hilarious. That was like the kicker. And then after that, I was out at dinner that night with, uh, with Joseph and Larry O'Brien. And, uh, you know, he asked if I'd like to work with him at CA Vertex and I, you know, was totally open to it. So I started 
you know, working with them in a business development kind of marketing function. And, uh, and so I worked with them for gosh, two and a half years. Uh, and that like, you know, opened up so many more kind of questions and answers and, you know, rabbit holes into the world of exchanges. And, and you were banking. living, you were living where and what, where are we now in time? This is 2014. This is about April of 2014. Mm. And this is, I'm in, I'm in Ottawa. And you're in Ottawa. I'm okay, in okay, Ottawa okay. at the time. And I, and I, and I just had a small, I just had my first child, Amelia, who is, uh, who would be five months old at that point. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So carry on. Yeah. So you were, you were, you were with CA Vertex for some time. So see, I mean, Joseph David uh, was the CEO, right. Of, of CA Vertex. And he's, uh yeah you're definitely a pioneer in this space i remember uh i remember using that exchange uh that was definitely i think probably my my first oh, man it was bitcoin like exchange a, experience it, it was such a <laughs> janky exchange but it worked uh, all that mattered like, you know that's all that matters and we were also friends with like canadian bitcoins too and and those guys and they still have the same website from back in the day and it still works and they're still working and more stories over at that crew too but uh and then in april too there was uh there was an election for the bitcoin alliance of canada which was uh you know a non-profit towards helping consumers businesses and, and government policymakers understand cryptocurrency so i ran for the ran for a director position there and i won i won the seat uh in that organiz that you know that outfit was started by Anthony Diorio, and so then I got involved with uh, you know with efforts there, and then uh, I think it was about a year later that Anthony kind of stepped down to focus on his projects, and the board kind of elected me to be the executive director of it. And then there was like kind of the rise of the whole blockchain space too, and Bitcoin just kind of I don't know it seemed to have a bit of a negative kind of view amongst government and regulators so we rebranded to the blockchain association of canada and just continued our work um, you know evangelizing crypto staying true to bitcoin but uh you know evangelizing and introducing and connecting you know doing our best to be ambassadors and weavers and wizards for the canadian crypto ecosystem and so you know i filled that role for five years and uh you know and, and that was uh that, that was a really valuable kind of experience. I think we did uh, a lot of good and we, we, you know, were there to support the rapid growth of this new industry in Canada, which, you know, is blossoming right now. And it's, you know, it's, it's huge. Like, let's think about sunny, like, you know, how big was the first meetup you had? I remember coming down to Toronto every month or two for, for your meetups and they started small, but boy, oh boy, did they get big and did things yeah, ever massive. change? <laughs> yeah, we got, we got, we had so many people, we ended up getting kicked out of, uh, let, let's, let's name it. Let's, let's remain unnamed. We will, the place will remain unnamed, but we got kicked out of a few places. We, we were breaking fire codes. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, um, and the subset of people that were coming out too. This is why I love this space so much because it was so diverse. Like, you know, we just had passionate, really interested people at different levels of uh, understanding of the technology from far, from different backgrounds, all coming together to share this bond over Bitcoin and hope and, you know, an opportunity and faith that, you know, I think there's like a common understanding around many of the, the, the systemic challenges that we face as a civilization as a result of, you know, thousands of years of centralized monopoly money and systems of control being in place. And how do we've got this amazing new opportunity that, you know, I believe can help us come into a golden age. So anyways, I, 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 I digress from my, from my past. And then, and then as part of this, I also was advising different companies and, 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 you know, and assisting and connecting. And I'd like to just help people and uh you know and 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 you know and add value where i can and how how i can so you know, i became an advisor to coinberry which is one of canada's you know leading kind of brokerage exchanges right now 
I uh, was an advisor to Data Wallet, who did a, you know, was one of the stars of the ICO boom. And, you know, they're continuing to, to crank away. Um, yeah, I was uh, assisted with all sorts of different kind of projects. I wrote a book called The Unified Wallet, Unlocking a Digital Golden Age. Uh, I was partook, in, partook and spoke in many different conferences and different activations and over the years have watched this space evolve too from back in 2013 when it was i would say much more technical and maybe like you know and kind of hobby and and kind of cypherpunk and the beginning of and the libertarian kind of influence was coming in and then i think the libertarian influence got a lot stronger and then we saw like you know some corporate interests start coming into it, especially around the whole blockchain, like the blockchain, not Bitcoin space. And then I remember like being down in Puerto Rico for the first restart week. And that's when I was like, holy, okay. Now, like, you know, the artists have arrived. And then it was when like, you know, there was a huge contingent of burners from, from Burning Man who showed up and, uh, you know, it just started getting really cool. And, uh, yeah, and then we went. I was in Davos for like you know the year that there was a huge crypto presence, and it was amazing to see like you know the central planners all operating within their walls, and then on the outside just this like you know this very free thinking, uh, solution oriented builders gathering open conversations about the future of humanity and what's possible with this technology, which I think ran in contrast to what was happening inside those gates of the, of the fancy hotels there. So, yeah. Interesting. Uh, (laughs) So what happened? So you, you've had some, uh, I guess, so a CA vertex that was, um, I'm sure. I feel the sun's uh, not looking so good here. Yeah, I got a little bit of sun in my eyes, but it was kind of artistic because it was, it was it was fitting as you were talking about art, like, was, like the <laughs> spectrum of colors like coming over. I'm like, did he did he plan this shit? And like, this is good. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is cool, man. I like uh, I'm I'm feeling this. This this Zoom thing is is good. It it makes you feel like you're. It, it's as good. To, it's it's as as close to you know being with someone as as you can imagine. So, uh, so w- w- what's next? What what happens after that um, for you in terms of, you know, I- I'm just curious. Like, how how did you? I remember you even told me uh, maybe it was over a beer or something. Um, the story around kind of your current project and, and how that came to be. But, but like, yeah, what kind of problems were you seeing in this space? I guess, or what kind of challenges did you think that you, you know, where where did your story? And your narrative fit into this ecosystem because I think that's kind of a big question for a lot of people, right? Like, it's like, how do you figure out like what do you do or like we know what I mean? <laughs> right. And I think I, I I missed something in explaining my story too, and that was change tip. So oh, change right. tip change tip was yeah. So I learned of this project called change tip pretty early on in its in its existence when I started seeing people sending Bitcoin over Twitter. And it just kind of like, you know, got me, got me thinking. It was like, wow, it was really easy. You could send people crypto over Twitter. All they needed to do to start an account was log in with one of their social accounts. And then they could send Bitcoin freely. It's an off-chain solution. So it's a custodial service. But that didn't really give me any gripes because it wasn't, we're not talking about huge value transfers. It was like small payments. Like they were going after the tipping gratitude market, which didn't really exist, but um, this was a way for creating kind of awareness and adoption. And I just thought it was incredible. And I ended up being, I think probably the number one user on the platform and just yeah, introducing people to Bitcoin that way. And also pushing the limits of it because it was really easy to get started. Like you could have a wallet just by logging in with Facebook, like no, no big KYC process, no driver's license, no selfie pics, none of that. It's super easy to get in there, 
small value transfers, but no fees on the transfers, really, really easy way. And you could have a lot of fun with it, uh, just given, the, given their whole thing. One of the things was, I wasn't too crazy about the name. And this is something that's just, I don't know, maybe like from my perspective, like brand and names like really mean a lot. And uh, like the change tip, but just the word tip isn't like from the serving industry, people don't like love tipping. It's not like a something and in, introducing a tech to people. They were like, you know, I don't really tip people online, so I'm not going to use this. But I was like, oh, but you can send a text message. Like you can create a link a unique link and send it to someone in a text message and you can put $50 on that, or you can send somebody a hundred dollars over Twitter. Like it's incredible. It's, it's amazing. You, this is social money transfer. And, uh, yeah, like I just don't get it. I'm not really tipping. And that's when, when, if your name doesn't align to like, you know, the full product suite that you're offering at the full value you're offering, there's a little bit of a disconnect. So I was in Miami during one of the Bitcoin hackathons for the North American Bitcoin conference. And, we came together with a group of, uh, I met an awesome team after, well, I would first say that at the conference, I had this like vision, this clarity that, man, the ecosystem is strong. All the foundation has been laid for, for crypto. Like it's here, it's ready. Now it's like, we got to build this house. We got to finish this house. We got to finish this castle that it, that is crypto. And we need some, you know, we need to make it easier for people. So I wanted to just take change tip. And just simplify, just strip out a bunch of the kind of the, the, the little bells and whistles and make it make it just about sending and requesting money, like getting rid of the whole tipping thing. And just make it about sending and requesting money. Make it just that easy. Log into Facebook or Twitter, you get your account, and you can send and request money like Venmo, but with crypto and it's free and it's fast and it's, and it's got a feed. So it's like simple. So uh, I got fully on on that program and joined up with some hackers and over the course of four days like we built a we built a, 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 a full-on prototype for a mobile app that leveraged the entire change tip back end um and 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 worked challenges we never we never got it to got it to market and it was interesting one of the it's it, change tip themselves they weren't super supportive of it even though we're building on their platform. I think they viewed me and it as a bit of a threat. And yeah, that just kind of like hurt things. And then ultimately, like that was in the wind, that was in like the bear winter of crypto too. So they didn't last too, too much Where longer are we now? after that. What year are we in, Kyle? That was 2015, 2016. Mm. So that was like, you know, Change Tip was a victim of the first winter when the, when it went to a thousand and then you know was low in the in the hundreds in the three four five hundred dollar range for like you know two to five hundred dollar range for a long time it wasn't it was just everyone was just building but there wasn't a whole bunch of you know the price wasn't moving and uh and anyway so but that <clears throat> that whole what the, the the moral of this was i introduced the tech to a lot of people and it became clear that at the core one needs a wallet like that is the absolute essential thing that every person on the planet must do is get a wallet as as you don't need to get a ledger or a a trezor or like a fancy piece of hardware that basically gives you a vault for crypto but doesn't make it easy to use you need a way to, to to initially start in crypto and i think that's where like the mobile wallet is the easiest way and looking at all the different wallets in the space, like I just, you know, there are some challenges around user experience uh, with Bitcoin. One of the big differentiators of Bitcoin wallets to any previous consumer solution is the seed mnemonic and is writing down 12 or 24 words. Like before Bitcoin, had you ever written down 12 words? I'm trying to remember. I don't like think so. as, as a backup key. No, like it's just it's just something that people have never done before. And you know, for us who are like you know innovators and early adopters, like okay, we'll 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 roll with those. But when we talk about mainstream adoption, like you know, that's a that's a bit of a challenge. So, anyways, I've you know, and then and I'd, I'd also say that as part of this, as part of the 
the well, the the change tip iteration that we're building, we call it social wallet. I'll refer to it as that. So as part of social wallet was also understanding the <clears throat> the true potential of the digital wallet, of the digital self-sovereign wallet, which I then began calling the unified wallet. And then I wrote a book called the unified wallet. And this is talking about, okay, what happens when we have full control of our crypto keys, of our Bitcoin keys, so we have control of our money, but then thinking as well about your wallet, like in a wallet that you open up, a traditional wallet that you open up, it's got the cash slot. And that's like where the Bitcoin goes. But then you've got all the card slots. Uh, and all the card slots is where I feel like blockchain comes in. And, you know, instead of cards, we're going to have keys for all these different services. And instead of passwords, we hold keys. And we need a wallet to keep those in. So that's kind of the, the idea behind the unified wallet. And once we have all these in a digital store, we'll be able to start allowing, like right now, my cards can't talk to each other and my cards can't talk to the money in a physical wallet. But once it's a digital wallet, they can all start talking to each other and you can start doing things. Then you get to benefit from digital programmable money and identity and verified credentials, et cetera. So, you know, so really digging on that led me into the whole digital identity space. You know, I hooked up with this guy, hooked up. I met this man named Tim Buma out of Ottawa, who, um, who's one of like the Canadian government leaders in digital identity. He actually wrote the foreword to the book. We've spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, just the key, the need for the wallet. And, um, you know, so I, I, after writing that book, I was like, I'm not going to try building the wallet. It's too much. And then uh, I was over in Switzerland last year. Uh, I was invited by the Canadian Trade Commission based on my work with the Blockchain Association of Canada to come talk to the Crypto Valley Conference, which is in Zug, Switzerland, about the Canadian ecosystem, and then go kind of on tour with a couple of these uh, like trade commissioners or you know people who work in the trade office and, uh, over there. And so that was like you know just amazing. I love Switzerland. I think Switzerland is absolutely incredible. And it was at this conference, you know that we decided or I, I was I was you know introducing the tech again to all these people who are theoretically or, 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 or positioning themselves as crypto experts or involved in crypto businesses but have don't hold any crypto on their phones don't have wallets so it just came back to setting up wallets and at the time edge wallet and I still at, at the time time now I recommend edge wallet I think it's the best wallet for people to get started in the space because it just uses the username and password and it kind of works like a like a one pass or a last pass you have mm -hmm. a master password and then underneath it you keep it keeps all of your private keys for all the different chains because if you have bitcoin and litecoin and ethereum and dash and eos and bsv or bch or whatever different different cryptos each one has its own key and those are 12 or 24 words that you're gonna have to back up for every single one if you want to do them you know individually but this one brings it all into one and it also allows you to trade directly within the wallet to buy within the wallet and you can buy gift cards directly within the wallet too so like you know i can go just to you know to whole foods or to i you know i just the other day went to uber eats and bought a bought a you know bought 50 dollars worth of uber eats credit and paid with dash uh, wait, wait, what are we talking yeah. about right now? What, what, what are we, are you talking, talking about, about social edge wallet. wallet, edge wallet? Okay, edge wallet, okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we're, yeah. Talking about, we're talking about edge wallet. And this okay, is the okay, wallet yeah. that I was introducing. Edge wallet, this is Paul, Paul Puy, Puy, right? Paul Puy, yeah. Right, Paul right, Puy right, 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 right. San Diego, right. one of the absolute best. Yeah. Uh, edge uh, wallet started as Airbits. And mm. Airbits started as a result of a hackathon at the uh, Bitcoin Expo in Toronto in March, 2014, I believe was when that happened, or maybe it was April, 2014, sometime around then. And they won the hackathon and that's what started Airbit. And I didn't even know, you know that. Still, I was there for that. I was there at that event. I didn't even know that that was the case. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And they're still cooking today and they, and they've just, you know, it's, it's a, it's a badass, it's a badass wall platform. And, but one of the challenges that I ran into in Switzerland was when I said edge people, they couldn't actually say it back to me. It was like hedge. And then in trying to find it in the app store to download, it wasn't, it wasn't there. So I was like, 
And I was like, Paul, like, have you considered, you know, rebranding or, or, or like, what are your thoughts on this? So he's like, well, we just moved from edge or airbits to edge. Like we're not rebranding, but Kyle, if you want to, you know, make unified wallet and take what we're doing and put your own spin on it and, you know, apply all this feedback that you're providing to us into a product like, you know, we will, we'll, would we'd love to work on that with you and, and help you realize that vision. So, you know, that was the, you know, a fateful call on June 26, 2019 with, uh, with Paul that kind of, that started the whole social wallet uh, or not social wallet, Swiss key, uh, which initially we wanted to call Swiss wallet, but, uh, yeah, that word was take, wallet was taken by uh, a bunch of Swiss bankers. But Swiss Keys, after working with Jason King, I'm not sure if you know who Jason King is, but I've been kind of brainstorming around names and branding with him. And the idea of Swiss Key, uh, the word wallet is kind of has been a little bit of a pain for me. I mean, I need to call the book it, but there's so many different types of wallets. It's kind of different. Uh, and at the core, what these wallets are is they're keychains. And I also like the way that the, your mouth looks after you say key. You say key, you're smiling, right? Just say it, Sonny. Key. 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 Yeah. No, 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 I got you, I got you. Okay, 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 fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Hello, so, key's a thing. And, and then it was generated out of Switzerland and then Barack Obama called... Uh, called Bitcoin, like having a Swiss bank account in your pocket. And the community was like, well, it's actually more like having a Swiss bank in your pocket. And, you know, this, and then the Swiss symbol itself is like a really powerful image. Um, and I think that's something that's really important within branding is that uh, a logo generates kind of some sort of subliminal reference. And with the edge wallet logo it's kind of just two squares kind of a little bit connected green and blue um from uh from uh, wasn't really like doing it for me uh so we went like okay let's go the swiss branding and it was like you know swiss branding is very very kind of medieval shields and and and, and sigils and and keys too like you know the ubs the bank it's just three keys whatever so anyways we we picked uh, the most basic kind of symbol which is just a, a swiss the swiss shield and put swiss key into it in a, in a unique frame um and automatically this 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 logo it just kind of you know I'm sure, yeah, here it is on my sound box but um you know it's got the it's got the white cross in it which is like if you go to the beach and you see a lifeguard, they all wearing that. That's the symbol of the lifeguard. The inverse is the red cross, the symbol of safety. Um, red and white as a color combination is a powerful combination that emo that evokes uh, sensations of both danger and safety. Um, <clears throat> the Swiss symbol, the country of Switzerland, is known for its privacy, its neutrality, its quality, its sensibility. So these are all kind of like you know at the core traits of and characteristics of the brand that you know I wanted to build around this and so since then I've been actively working and building out a suite of solutions including repackaging edge wallet and working with the edge team to uh, to get that to market and we've also partnered with a group called Tangem uh, who make these NFC cards uh, that are basically crypto wallets. So this is like a crypto, this is a crypto wallet all in itself. This is an Ethereum one. We have a Bitcoin one too. And crypto onto it. And when it's on it, the crypto is on here. You, there, there's a private key inside the, the card and it can't be withdrawn. So the card is the key. And this is like, a, this is like crypto in cash form. Crypto cash. I don't know. It's pretty, it, these are, I feel like a great way to, to get in there. So we've got the physical product and then a lot of the mobile product uh, with the goal of making crypto more accessible to the masses. How does that sound, Sonny? Sorry, I muted myself so I didn't interrupt you. But yeah, uh, fascinating, fascinating. Okay, I, I was unaware of that, that edge 
piece that you were working with the edge team on that that that's super cool big fan of their platform and uh yeah paul's a paul's a rock solid guy um we've got a guest hey 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 Hey, sequoia (laughs) hello (laughs) so 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 uh kyle where, where on earth are you I mean, without giving away your specific location, because we yeah. know that's a, a security risk. <laughs> but where in the world yeah, are so you? So <laughs> right now I'm in Southern California, and uh, I'm here with my son Sequoia and my wife Brittany, and uh, and her her son Bowen, and we're just in just outside of San Diego in the hills. I feel like there's I feel like there's gold all around us. We went to visit a gold mine the other day, and there's a little stream right right next to where we're staying. And, considering getting a, a shovel and a pan and panning for some gold just to see if it's there. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Well, let me know if you, if you strike, maybe I'll move down there. Uh, how, so I was going to, okay. So, so, okay. Um, maybe let's move on to the next one. Sure. So my next question was around, you know, what, what is one, uh, you know, belief that you hold to be true, which you think most others in crypto or, you know, let's say blockchain would uh, would disagree with you on, or Bitcoin would be disagree would be yeah would disagree with you on. Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I I think one of my beliefs is that we need one we need one wallet. Like individuals need one place to keep their keys. I like need a last pass. Need a a a single centralized source where you are the central authority on it to hold your keys for all your different solutions. Because right now, well, man, I mean, gosh, Sonny, how many wallets have you downloaded? How many platforms are you involved in? How many keys and passwords are you keeping within the crypto space? It's it's complicated. And uh, I just don't think that's going to like scale for adoption. Um, as one thing so that's kind of you know one of the key key reasons i'm doing what i'm doing um well another thing too is like i don't know i really believe in competition and you know i love bitcoin i think bitcoin is awesome but i'm not going to like say that bitcoin is the only solution um i think bitcoin made a lot possible and proved a lot but uh you know i'm i'm not like, you know, it'll piss off kind of the maximalist camp, but I don't believe that it's just all about Bitcoin, 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 only Bitcoin, everything else is a scam. Like, I just don't think so. I think we're moving into a world of hyper tokenization, like hyper Bitcoinization, but also hyper tokenization, where, um, you know, we're going to have tokens for everything. We're going to see, uh, you know, our licenses become tokens, our, our, our company shares become tokens, our, our, our degrees becoming tokens our you know our co-ops our voting is going to get tokenized and gosh wouldn't that be great especially after this nightmare scenario that we're seeing unfold you know in america right now mm. yeah interesting interesting yeah so hy- hyper tokenization um by the way uh is there some sort of finality i mean I, in terms of what's happening in the with the presidential elections is, is has someone been chosen no. yet as you know our our uh our next king the only finality is that um you know november 3rd has come and gone and uh but we don't know who who the who the leader is uh we know that Donald Trump is currently in office and uh, I don't think he's going to give it up very easily. I think he performed a whole lot better than um, was expected of him to perform during this. Um, The landslide that, you know, the media was calling for did not occur. Uh, Quite the opposite happened. And now it's, now it's just, going to be well i don't know they keep just counting and there's there's going to be a lot you know it's a it's a, it's a dicey time it would be so much better if there was uh you know real transparency and accountability within the voting system so that there wasn't so much 
room for shenanigans and accusations to take place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find it surprising, though, that, that I mean, given how um, sophisticated our phones are, given how sophisticated technology is that we don't use our phones to just not just vote. I also find it super weird that we vote once every four years. I think we should be able to like micro vote on, on decisions and only if you want to type of thing. But I, I find it anyways, that's maybe. I totally uh, agree. I totally agree. I mean, have you, have you heard, have you looked at the Switzerland, uh, the way that Switzerland works? Tell so, me. I've heard I, everything I've read about Switzerland's always been fascinating, and uh, but I'm, tell me, tell me a little bit more. Yeah, so like, you know, uh, politics isn't a big thing in Switzerland. Like, if not, someone doesn't like, you know, doesn't dedicate themselves to becoming a politician in Switzerland. It's not like that. Doesn't have the same kind of allure as it does in the West. But in Switzerland, they've got the, they've got kind of the most active functioning form of direct democracy on the planet. Uh, you can go out. If there's something you don't like in society, you can go out and get a hundred. If you can get a hundred thousand signatures, the entire country will vote on it in the next referendum. And they have four days a year uh, for referendums. And those are days when everybody gets off to, to take, to make their votes. And there's incredible awareness and education about the issues that are being voted on. And uh, so, and if, and if the po general population votes it, it will become the law. Like, you know, the, it, it, is, it is set up in a way that enables direct democracy. Uh, so I think that that's something like, you know, that we uh, can, can look forward to hopefully seeing work in other places, because I think I was, I was listening to Howard Schultz give a speech. He was the CEO of, he was the founder of Starbucks. And he was contemplating a, a, an independent run uh, this past election. Uh, ultimately, decided not to because he didn't believe you know had a, had a viable op, viable chance. But he just expressed that you know if 90% of the population believes in something and are, are behind it, it has a 30% chance of passing, like in the house. And if 30% of people believe something or 50% of people believe in something. It has a 30% chance of passing in the house just because that the way that the political system is set up, there's just so much like, you know, division where, you know, one party says up, the other one says down. And that's just, it it's just, It doesn't matter whether the entire population agrees on something. It's like, we say up, we say down, like, that's it. And it's just like, you know, there is no democracy. Like this isn't democracy. This isn't representative democracy, uh, you know, making these votes. And this is my issue with Canada too. Uh, like, you know, on the last election, I went in to go cast a vote and it's huge operation at the end. And then I get in there and I get one little piece of paper that's literally this long and I get to make one mark on it. And that's, that's my, that's my federal, like national part, like democratic participate participation in <laughs> our, in our system is one mark on a paper. And before <laughs> that vote, I like didn't actually, uh, when you see the ballot, there's a whole bunch of names of people that you don't see. So absolutely. Let's get those on our phones b beforehand so I can know who my options are to vote, what the people, different people stand for. And let me be able to cast that ballot directly from my phone using a token. So I can be like, you know, given a voting token, not necessarily have it attributed to my name, but I'm holding the token. And then if I want to cast it for Sunny, you literally have an address. That's your public address. That is where you collect your vote. And I sent it to you. And then, you know, I, we can verify it all day long. I can verify that my vote counted. There's none of this crap. Like we're going to be seeing over the next little bit, kind of a ton of talk in America about invalid votes or canceled votes, et cetera, because people like sign them improperly or use the wrong type of pen or marker or et cetera, et cetera you know, when they were, when they were, when they were filling it out and all that kind of crap can be, can be undone, um, you know, there's also history of dead people voting and like, you know, that's crazy.
Oh, sorry, dude. That's oh, my sorry, bad. Dude, that's my that's bad. My bad. Okay. Oh, sorry, dude. That's my bad. Okay. 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 Okay. There's an infinite loop. <laughs> that was freaky. Yeah. Are you Are you back? I'm back. Sorry, I'm that was back. my if bad. I, I, I was on mute. That or... was kind of freaky, but yeah. Cause... It's okay. It was my bad. For anybody bad, watching, actually. it's okay. Um, no, what I was gonna, what I was gonna say, so, so Kyle, you mentioned at the beginning of this, this, this uh, interview. Sure, we'll call it that. Um, that that you know, you're you're from a fairly, you're you know, you're from Ottawa. Uh, you're you're from a family that's you know fairly political, I guess you could say. Yet here you are, um, you know, dedicating a lion's share of your, you know, adult career here uh, towards Bitcoin and something that is, you know, arguably very different, right? So I'm just curious, like, you talked a bit about, you know, your story, um, but like, was there like an aha moment or was there like a moment or was it more like a process where you were kind of like, I don't know, where you had all these like kind of realizations like i'm talking more specifically around bitcoin like when 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 that came into your life like how, how, how did that look exactly yeah i mean like you know in in previous to that too so yeah i mean i'm from a political family and it's like a liberal family if you will i'd say my dad my father's kind of more of a conservative mm. um but uh in you know i remember Ron Paul, like Dr. Ron Paul mm. and his 2008 run when just, I remember uh-huh. witnessing the incredible passion and the intelligence and like, you know, the joie de vivre that these, that his supporters and like, you know, their radical action they're doing, like the money bombs, the blimps, like, and they were just going against the system. Like they, like his message was audit the Fed. Like the Fed is the enemy and like, you know, and then watching Ron Paul just get like, you know, systemically dismantled by the mainstream media who are, you know, the propaganda arm of the central banks. I happily say that. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, and then from there, it was like, that was like the light bulb moment. It was like, man, this fiat system, like it's got to go. And I was really kind of into gold and Ron Paul was a big advocate for gold. And so, I remember I was like looking, I don't know, somewhere in the vaults, there's a, there's a, a big schema. I don't know where it is anymore, but it was a full schema for digital gold. And uh, like, you know, how can we have a reserve of the, of gold and then be able to like, you know, issue like micro amounts and be able to people to be able to transact in basically allocated gold, but in a digital format. And I thought that would be really great. And then I saw Bitcoin and then that just initially was like, no, this doesn't, I didn't, didn't get it enough time. That was really early. Just didn't give it enough time. And like, no, this, this won't, this won't work. And then it was like, you know, years of more impressions around Bitcoin until it's finally like, ah, aha, like this, this truly like this solves like, you know, the big challenge with that digital gold thing was there's too much trust going into it. Like you need to trust in the in, in that gold vault. We need to trust in the numbers around gold supply. Uh, you know, we need to we need to believe and trust that you know that governments are actually holding on to these reserves of gold. And but there it's it's questionable as to why they won't be audited for it. Uh, yeah. So you know, in in terms of an alternative, and then. Yeah, and then crypto, it just seemed like, you know, it seemed like Bitcoin was, was this, you know, had all the characteristics to, uh, to provide an alternative to the central banking madness that has, you know, led to genocides and war and more war and more war. I've also seen like my other brother, my so Justin is prime minister, but Sasha, he was like a documentary filmmaker, Alexandre Trudeau. He is a documentary filmmaker and he was like, you know, he was covering the Liberian civil war, like a, just a vicious, nasty war. And that was never talked about. And then he was like, you know, on both sides of the fence and in, in Gaza, like, you know, and like, you know, meeting with both sides and, 
the end of the day, people everywhere are, are good people. And there's just a lot of like, you know, fueled hate into them. And then I remember like, you know, in 2003, it was very clear that, you know, the war was going to go to go to Iraq. And he saw the saw all the writings on the wall. So he went to Iraq and uh, and lived with a Christian family. Like he went in like embedded as part of like, you know, the media team. And then he escaped from the green zone and went and lived with a family and, and witnessed the destruction of Babylon, called Baghdad. Um, you know, over the over the next months, as part of Operation Shock and Awe, uh, you know, which was one of those ridiculous wars perpetrated on bogus narratives, um, you know, that we're still paying the price of today. So, you know, I am definitely anti-war, and I do not like to see see you know death and rape and pillage. Uh, on false pre- false pretenses. Yeah, well, I agree with you on that one. <laughs> um, hey, Kyle, uh, okay, so I guess we kind of already, so one of my, uh, I mean, I have a whole bunch of other questions, but one of my main final questions was kind of around a contrarian belief that you hold outside of the Bitcoin blockchain space, right? But just in the context of the world today, um, yeah, and and I guess the kind of I mean I'm hearing one of them as being, you know, a kind of a, I guess a uh, what do you want to say, a lack of belief in in the traditional uh, kind of system, if you will, that 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 we've set up, and and almost like a a sense of hope, right? That that Bitcoin presents a new way, a new way that maybe represents the people uh, to some extent. I don't know. Um, but 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 any other contrarian beliefs maybe that you have or uh, some some ideas? I know you have lots. Oh, of them, totally. But, uh, I'm, I'm like a, I, I'm I definitely <laughs> polarized. Um, yeah, I mean, I I I I believe like you know from on the optimist hand that we're entering a golden age that you know that we have all the resources, uh, all the food, all the capacity to house, feed, and 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 shelter you know, everyone on this planet, you know, times a hundred potentially in terms of population and that we can, we can usher in a, a, an age of prosperity. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 there's so much fear, uncertainty and doubt out there. And I believe that like fear is our only enemy. And, you know, and I'll, I'll also say that I believe that this COVID thing is a total, is a total, crock of shit and uh, and yeah and it's it's just we we again like you know our fears have been weaponized against us and we're seeing our rights and freedoms being ripped away like i can't get back into canada right now because if i get back to canada i gotta be there for 14 days in quarantine with everybody thinking i'm sick and everything is based on these on and and all of the science is being predicated off of these PCR tests, which, you know, need a thorough investigation into how they're working because there's a lot of questions around it. And we're making massive decisions for the fate of humanity and the fate of Canada and the fate of the United States, et cetera, based on this fear narrative that somehow we have to stop germs. And this is like this germ warfare. It's like, you know, but there's zero talk around healthy immune systems, about the importance of vitamin D, about the importance of vitamin C, about the importance of good nutrition, about the importance of touching other people and interacting with other people to be able to share. Our bodies literally have a microbiome that talks to other bodies and learns from other bodies. And in the last year or in the last, you know, what are we, eight months, uh, we have seen people enter this phase of isolation and using hand sanitizer like crazy, which literally nukes your microbiome on your hands, which is going to make actually people much more susceptible to sickness, in my opinion, and all these goddamn masks too. I'm not a fan of these masks. I think they're something much bigger at play with the masks than, than keeping people safe. It's actually, I feel like it's a control thing. So that's another contrarian thing than, 
that you know I will will say, and it's and it's a and it's a and it's a challenge, especially when you know they want to put masks on all the children, and I don't want my kids wearing masks when they're playing with other kids. Like, I don't know about you, but I don't like wearing a mask. I I can't breathe properly. I wear glasses; they fog up. And um, you know, if 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 our bodies were meant to wear masks, we'd be born with masks. And oh oh shit, we have them. They call our nose and our lungs, and they're there to protect us. We don't need to stick a piece of of, of cotton over it or three layers of cotton as our incredible Dr. Tam in Canada has advised that everybody in Canada must wear three ply masks on their faces to keep us safe from this invisible enemy. Uh, it's 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 uh, a quagmire it's uh, an interesting situation to say the least um hey i have a question for you um uh kyle uh, what are your thoughts on universal basic income positive negative indifferent somewhere in the middle I mean, I think like universal basic income, like in theory, is 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 a good idea. Um, you know, how do you keep the incentives aligned for people? I don't think like you know there can be universal basic income that basically you know stops people from wanting to create value in their own world. I think you know the the desire to accumulate you know, wealth and experience and, and sharing and, 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 and building of one, oneself and one's individual kind of wealth is something that, you know, guides many, has guided us as civilization. Um, and all of a sudden saying, you know, here is just a, a, a you know, a monthly check to make sure, you know, you, you can, can do everything you need. Um, you know, is, uh, is, is a solution that is a healthy solution for society. Um, you know, that said, the world is moving into an incredibly automated, uh, automated, world, uh, you know, fashion, and we don't need the amount of labor, you know, that we once did. Um, it's just, it's, it's not the case. There's simply not enough, like, you know, jobs out there uh, as we move forward for everyone. So, you know, the, 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 the concept of the, the idea of like, you know, universal basic access or income, um, you know, is, is a good, is, is a good thing. And, you know, I think with digital currencies, we can make that, you know, pretty readily accessible to everyone. Uh, the question is like, you know, it can be, you know, presented as, um, as a great opportunity, and then it can, you know, actually result as a, uh, you know, as a, a another tool of control um, when you make people fully dependent on the state. Uh, that's 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 the danger of of that. I think communities, I th and I think. Like you know, tr like you know, like going back in history, I think communities have always kind of taken care of their own. And I and like you know, speaking to Switzerland, like you know, if you're really hard up, it's like if you know the Canton is responsible for you, and they'll take care of you and help help get you back there. But when we look, it's like you know, when we look, instead of looking to our neighbors to help us uh, or our towns or our village, uh, when we start looking towards like you know the federal state, like, you know, the highest level to be able to take care of us, um, you know, that creates a sense of disconnection and, uh, you know, and, and, and won't actively kind of solve our challenges, but yeah. Okay. I, I, I got it. Cause I got to ask you something. Well, what so, do you think about, what do you think? No, about no, no, okay. So I, okay. I want to, I want to bring up a couple of uh, threads that came up along the, the conversation today. Right. So you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned RIM earlier, right? Uh, we talked a bit about AI, although not a whole lot, but like there is this like a, a kind of, I guess, common understanding amongst a lot of people that, uh, computers are advancing at an alarming rate where, you know, we could potentially create heaven on earth or maybe the opposite, depending on how we proceed. Um, but, but there are concerns around AI in the sense that, um, you know, what is it like maybe 
two governments and five companies own all of the data, all of the food for this, whatever this, this, this thing is that we want to call it is pretty much fed through, you know, a handful of entities. Um, we also talked a little bit about universal basic income. I agree with you though, is that the dependence on the state does not sit well with me. The idea of inflating people's money um, also doesn't sit well with me because then you're taking money away from people who have earned it. Um, you know, Bill Gates recently said, you know, how if there's an individual that works for Microsoft and is earning $50,000 a year and that person's taxed, you know, um, and you know, and by the way, whether I agree or disagree with tax, that's another conversation, right? But let's just say, you know, um, we live in the paradigm that we do today. Uh, once that human being at Microsoft is replaced by a robot, that $50,000 worth of, you know, productivity or whatever it is, it's not being taxed anymore. Um, and so well, I guess what I'm getting at is, is that I sometimes wonder, can a free market, I repeat, free market-based solution, um, like almost like a reimagination, if you will, of technology, right? Um, really embracing the open source-ness of, you know, kind of the, the technological space, embracing the decentralization element. Can humanity come together and create an incentive structure such that the profits of automation are systematically fed back into some sort of UBI, like universe and using blockchain, let's say, right? Uh, so that, 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 that's like a kind of a bit of a, I don't know, mind experiment that I've been kind of going through, just trying to think like, you know, again, using free market principles, you know, not, not violating those, but like figuring out can something like even the phones that we use today, right? And anyway, that's why I said RIM is like, you know, Canada, Toronto, this where I live, or at least where, where I'm around, there's a lot of people with a lot of talent. And I sometimes think like, you know, in our lifetime, we saw Blackberry go from being the thing. Like literally when I met my wife, she used to have a Blackberry. That was less than 10 years ago. And today Blackberry is like historic. Like it doesn't even prehistoric, right? Um, but, you know, could it become like could those people still live here, right? Like, so could those people come together and again, marry, op like, have you heard of Pine64? Like, they make phones that are open source. Like, you can buy computers that are open source. So why couldn't, you know, a completely new ecosystem be built off of these open source platforms that, I don't know, envision like a new, because like, because I, I think, I think that, with automation expanding, I think that people should should benefit from it, and and it shouldn't just be like Elon Musk and like you know four people like four billionaires that like just figure or or Jeff Bezos. Um, wouldn't it be nice if it could be such that everyone owned the robots? And maybe that's like a super communism type of thing, right? Which I definitely don't want to be flirting with, but. I do wonder like how, and especially maybe it's because I went to India growing up every year or whatever as a kid and I saw how much poverty there is in the world. Like there's gotta be a better way is my, my, my point. And I do wonder, you know, one of the projects that, that I, I find fascinating is um, Good Dollar. I've been talking about it a lot lately. It's by E, e. Toro founder, Yanni, who's the founder of, um, uh, who's the founder of, oh, his name's on the white paper for colored coins. He's a bit of an OG and he started a project called Good Dollar recently. And it's essentially Ubi on the Ethereum blockchain. <laughs> and when I was at the OECD uh, conference, blockchain conference last year, uh, they actually had Yanni speak as like their keynote or whatever. And it was just, it really caught my imagination. And I think they're flirting with ideas along those lines, but I, I do think a lot about like, how do you take all of this awesomeness and and make sure that everybody gets a piece of it and i'm not saying you need to like give everybody millions of dollars but like what if you could give everybody even ten dollars a day you figure out how to give everybody ten freaking dollars a day and you know that like most of the people on planet earth are living on ten dollars a day right like or half rather so ten dollars you don't need to solve for a million dollars for everyone like i'm not talking just like 10 bucks would make a hell of a difference um yeah. anyways yeah, and I mean, I, 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 I feel you, Sonny. I, I feel you, brother. And I think, uh, I, I just don't think, like, I think one of the key words is decentralization. 
in that whole thing is we need to stop like you know looking at this from these superstructures from these federal or you know global organizations trying to take the lead for everybody and you know apply this technology so that you know by like you know by by utilizing the services in your immediate vicinity and like you know in, engaging like one of the things i like about the tokenization revolution is like you know we can be we can be moving especially with security tokens we can be entering a stage where you know when i shop on amazon i'm actually earning some stock in amazon like as part of my purchases and I'm 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 gaining a vested interest, you know, in the businesses and the community and the communities that I support, and you know, and and look as we push it down from the big federal to the absolute kind of communities, you know, looking at it like from a, from almost a tribal perspective, where you know we're in little circles ourselves, and we you know we agree to you know social contracts, if you will, that uh, you know that make sure or, or not make sure, but that you know give everybody kind of a fair slice in the pie because you know like back to the bill gates example uh you know of losing a fifty thousand dollar employee like that guy's total chattel for microsoft and you know is not his it's just it's you know it's his oil in the machine um it's not he's not actively you know profiting or sharing or, or, or reaping the value to which to which he's providing into it so um you know i think as part of the projects that we're being involved in and you know realizing the true value that all of us have i think within this kind of you know we'll call call it like the first wave or like this you know in post-industrial revolution kind of corporatic system where you know, you're expected to have one job that pays your taxes and you have one line of income and like this is what you do, this is who you are, you fit into that little box. Like we have so much talent. Like, you know, how many different hustles do you have going on? Like, you know, how much value are you creating? Think about like those people who are working for the big companies, like, you know, in finance, for example. Like they might be doing some job that pays them a lot of money, but you know, in my view, a lot of those that the, the big finance jobs are just being are going to be are going to be lost over the you know in the coming decade or two as we see you know decentralized finance and and far more effective, efficient solutions rolling to market. So that's going to mean there's going to be a whole like you know wealth of talent freed up, so that people instead of working jobs that they're not actually creating much value, like you know it's something that a robot can do or computers can do. Maybe they'll be you know given the opportunity to realize their own dreams and create value you know, according to their own worldview and world belief about what makes them happy so that people can be doing what they love to do and generating value. And, you know, in the free market, the, the market generally will reward, you know, those to innovate. And also when gaps exist, people will generally come in to fill them. And so, you know, we, we, that's just the way that it works from a macro perspective is when there's a gap, it gets filled. Um, and, you know, and if, and if that gap is a whole bunch of talented people who, who are out of their, you know, shitty jobs that were paying them a lot of money and generating lots of, lots of like income tax revenue for the machine, like, well, then, uh, then they're going to, they're going to move and they're going to, they're going to pivot into, into, into new verticals. And there are so many different verticals, you know, out there. I think we're, we're just, we're like, you know, I mean, I, I hope. That we're moving away from, um, you know, the 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 age of the massive corporatocracy, and moving into smaller, more competitive, um, you know, responsible organizations that take care of their stakeholders, uh, you know, at all levels, and and reward their stakeholders so that we can bring in an era of prosperity uh, and i believe too that like you know there's going to be some people that get left left behind as part of that and that's where you know universal basic income can come in come into play to help those who are really getting left behind and more than just universal basic income but 
like being able to identify who it is that needs help and also providing a mechanism for those people to ask for help or be offered help, um, you know, to, for them to realize their, you know, their, their higher selves and, you know, and, and break out of, you know, many of the, the challenging cycles that, you know, many good, good, good souls and good hearts get lost into through, you know, violence or addiction or, you know, any number of, any number of devices of the world that trap people. And, you know, at the core, one of the other things is, is comes back to taxes too. And comes back to the idea that we must, as individuals, be transparent to a government or a global government uh, about our income. I just think that's crazy and just puts way too much power in that government or global government. And using blockchain and crypto and Bitcoin and CBDCs, etc., you know, we can move past income tax, which was a emergency war measures act that then became a holy a sacred cow for uh for governments as a means to 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 tax and enslave their citizens and control their citizens and we can eliminate that and and using this technology encourage people to earn as much as they can and you know in canada we have we have a a, a fairly high consumption tax and I know it works in the in the island nations too. Just having a, a flat consumption tax. And I think you marry a consumption tax with cryptocurrency, and you can have instant tax settlement, which is huge. Because like right now, as a business, like you actually act as the tax collector, and then you hold on to the taxes, and then you must remit it at some later point. So it puts a liability on you as a business to to do that, and that is you know, in my opinion, like morally wrong and like, and, and systemically broken because it, it creates like, you know, this, um, this opportunity for you to like, you know, to spend that money that's technically not yours, but you're holding on to, which gets you into, into trouble down the road. Whereas, you know, if, if, if on a time of consumption, there's just automatic settlement of taxes, like, you know, we could, we could basically see, you know, the government tax address getting little, little monies in it all the time. And, and while encouraging people to earn as much as they can. And if you're not spending enough, well, you can prove that you're not spending enough and record and, and, and receive, uh, receive a universal basic income or, uh, you know, a top up, um, you know, to do that. And I think that's I mean, like, you know, ways, one of the Kyle- ways. In some ways, we're kind of seeing, not maybe UB, but we are seeing a form of it in Canada, right? Like where they are, it's called CERB or something like that. They're not giving it to everyone, but a lot of people who've lost their jobs. Hey, Kyle, um, listen, man, we, we were at the we're, I mean, we're at the end of the hour and a half. We could probably go as long as you want. Um, but, uh, but I was going to say is, is that it's pretty interesting, at least for me. So even if you wanted to do like, uh, like a part two, like next week or next month or whenever your game, uh, even tomorrow, <laughs> I'd be down. <laughs> um, uh, but but I wouldn't mind keeping this one kind of like, you know, around what we talked about, which is your story, the story around your Bitcoin yeah, yeah. life, uh, you know, Swiss key. We talked about, you know, we even talked about some some kind of like more wild out there ideas like AI and Ubi. You know, were, were there any questions that you kind of wish I'd asked that maybe I, I didn't, uh, you know, on this line? I don't know. I really just enjoyed kind of the way that we've been we've been we've been rolling through this. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, there's uh, you know, we could I feel like we could riff on all sorts of different things, uh, you know, as, as we go forward. But, you know, certainly like, you know, the the the. I mean, we could talk about hodling versus spending <laughs> and giveling. <laughs> I'm down. Well, I mean, I think there's just so much going on, even like with the political landscape, whether in the US, whether it's like the coronavirus. I mean, there are, I just feel like you and I could just talk for hours. Um, uh, but, but I also want to make sure that if there are people who want to learn more about, you know, the projects that you're a part of, or they want to learn more about you or whatever, like Twitter handles, websites, all that kind of stuff. Do you want to maybe share that just so that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm on, on Twitter, I'm easy. I'm just Kyle Kemper. So 
So um, you can find me there. LinkedIn, Kyle Kemper. Um, SwissKey.io is the uh, is the page for SwissKey. Uh, hoping to you know get if you want to sign up, sign up to the newsletter, get notified when uh, when the app goes live. There's an opportunity if you support me and the vision, you can support. You can buy a Swiss Key Kit, which comes with uh, yeah, a book, a tangent card, or a Swiss Key card. Um, you know, a bunch of other little fun goodies. Um, you know, as means to it means to support the project. Yeah, I mean, shit. If you want, I've got a Patreon account. I'm actually going to be setting up a Patreon account for our family too, because we've been traveling around the uh, United States in a in a in a 40 foot blockchain across America RV and uh, have been, you know, driving awareness and adoption for, for crypto and using crypto basically wow. everywhere we can. And now uh, yeah, and, and, you know, that's, 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 that's me. And also if, you know, if you, if you got any questions, feel free to hit me up. If you have any requests, feel free to hit me up. I like to help people. I like to connect and, uh, you know, and solve problems and generate value. And, uh, you know, that's, that's my MO. So that's, that's where I'm at. So. That was awesome, Kyle. I, I say we, I say we uh, call it and then, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to kill the video. Thanks again, Kyle, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Like I said, uh, game to do this again soon. All right.